So um, basically, I'm just going to give you guys a bit of a brief overview of uh, CoreOS. Um, first of all, um, this is me. Uh, I've been using, I've been doing dev and ops and scrum related things for quite a while. And I've actually used operating systems which have the initials DOS in them. Um, and I've been around for a bit. So I've got like an RFC uh, in the two digit range which has my name attached to it. Um, so basically what I'm going to talk to you about today is um, what CoreOS is. Um, and, and what it is is really it's a layer that you, that you run and it's a operating system that you run which will give you a virtualized machine. Um, but that corresponds to a whole bunch of them. So uh, if you guys have ever used or heard the terminology clusters, basically you'll have a single machine and you'll be able to run a program on one machine and if that machine fails, you could that, mach that program or service will appear on another machine. Um, if you're talking about something like high availability, it means running it on multiple machines at the same time and then figuring out which way to route requests that are coming into um, a particular service across your cluster. And the key idea here is you want to allow machines to be brought in and out of clusters at will because hardware fails, unfortunately. Um, doing this makes things a bit more reliable. <clears throat> so what you currently, so CoreOS consists of a couple of components and one of them is obviously the kernel. Uh, another one is the cluster controller layer and that's called Fleet. And it's essentially a cluster-wide init system. So most of us will have heard of um, SysV5 or SysV init or BSDs init, um, or even more recently, uh, Upstart or Systemd. Fleet is basically um, taking advantage of Systemd's unit files and it can start services uh, across a range of machines. Other things that CoreOS provides is um, a, an ability to run services, and that is done using um, Linux kernel C groups. And the way that it's implemented, uh, oh, there's a variety of uh, implementations. One of them is Docker, which you may have heard of recently, which hit 1.0, I think, yesterday. And there's also LXC and uh, a couple of other custom ways. But um, Chorus is very much focused on running a service that is contained within a Docker um, instance, if you like. Um, and it also provides a, another, another configuration facility called a Cetrid. Now, <clears throat> I'm not sure if any of you guys have ever heard of the 12 factor manifesto. Anyone? Okay, cool. So basically, what this manifesto, there's a couple of things that you want to do with your application to make uh, deployments and builds repeatable. And one of the things that you want to do, or at least this manifesto says you should do, is to take away configuration from the code. So your testing environment, your staging environment, and your production environment all have exactly the same code on them. Um, all that changes is the configuration. So you would point them at, say, environment variables is one way, and another mechanism that you could do uh, point them at configuration is using a Cetra-D. Um, <coughs> and the last part that CoreOS provides is a reboot slash upgrade manager, because as I said, hardware fails, you're going to add in new machines, um, and there's going to be new releases of CoreOS. Uh, CoreOS actually gets released pretty frequently. So why might you wait? Why might you run CoreOS? Uh, basically, at the moment, it's got the latest version of Docker. Um, anyone actually using Docker yet? Okay, lovely. Um, it has a beta version of Acetra-D, um, but it's kind of like a Gmail beta when that label's applied to it. So it's actually pretty stable. Um, we've not had a failure, or at least I've not seen any failures of Acetra-D myself. Um, there's an alpha test version of Fleet, and um, also, it's kind of the hot thing in the system space, basically. All of which adds up to the perfect mean. Um, so some of the details there are, it has a couple of channels that you have. So right now it just has an alpha and a beta channel. The alpha channel is cut, I believe, um, on a fortnightly basis and the beta on a, on a monthly basis. So it's fairly frequent releases. They're aiming to have what they would call a production channel uh, later in the year. And just so for you guys who don't quite know, CoreOS, whilst it's all free software, uh, is backed by a commercial company, which is a venture company. So if you want to get early access, you can pay uh, as well. Um, so yeah, there's a variety of versions uh, that I've listed here. Actually, what I've uh, unfortunately done is I've flop, flipped around the alpha and beta numbers. So what you see there, that, so when it says Docker 1.0, that's actually in the alpha channel. And same with the other versions. So uh, in a bit more detail, you've got Fleet, 
Um, and that's essentially, as I said a bit earlier, system D for um, a group of machines. Um, system D, which I presume most of you will know, lets you run a, a daemon, and it confines that daemon inside of a, a, a Linux control group. So if the daemon forks, um, it can still follow and find out where, what processor it's using. Um, other other uh, system startup programs such as Upstart actually trace, do a ptrace on the program to find out what the eventual pit happens to be. Um, system just lets it run, waits till everything's settled down and goes, ah, that's the pit that I need to care about. Uh, with C groups, you can also do um, resource con confinement, so memory and um, I.O. and things like that. Fleet does the same, um, but lets you do this across all the machines on a cluster. So, um, System D, I, my gut feeling with Fleet, uh, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, I've, I've only used it briefly. I'm not used it in production, so bear that in mind. But um, it kind of feels like a good first stab in the dark of how you might run uh, you know, system unit activations across a cluster of machines. Um, it only adds a few things uh, on top of system D, so it kind of feels like eventually system D will absorb, as it does with quite a lot of other things, uh, this functionality into its corporate core stuff. And yeah, we can probably eventually system D everything. So um, we get a couple of constraints, and this is what Fleet provides, and they relate to where and how you might run a service. So there's, um, the, if, for, for those of you who've used or looked at a systemd file, you've got, declar you've got declarations of intent. So you might say, uh, this particular service only starts when multi-user um, has happened. And we've got three, four different types of constraints. Um, so, these allow you to do the allow you to have um, high availability, or allow you con con confine a service to um, run on particular machines. So you might want to have something that looks at your database server only run on the data only run on the database machines because it doesn't really make any sense for it to run on a web server. So in a bit more detail, the uh, those four sorry those yeah four constraints there. Uh, the conflicts there lets you implement high availability, and every systemd unit file has a name. So what you would do is you'd go say um, uh, Postgres dot asterisk dot service um, and as a conflicts line, and that means you can't have two machines in the cluster running the same service because it will only allow one instance of that on per machine. Excuse me, um, and then you might also have well some of the machine metadata might specify how much memory it has, and for your Postgres um, service you might want to have a machine that has 32 gigabytes and only run Postgres on that. So that's Fleet, which is lets you run and manage services across um, Core OS. Uh, the other component uh, is Acetrity, which is essentially a key value store. It's replicated, and um, a bit like Memcache, uh, for those of you who used it. Uh, however, it has its own consensus protocol, and it can elect its own peers. Um, it has a few features, which is similar to Redis, but again, it's a bit similar. Um, it's, it's simpler um, than Redis. And uh, like every good tool, it also comes with its own meme. And um, you can, one of the nice things that you can do with a Citrid is have a large, large set of machines uh, running together and have quite a few in standby. So I said it's a key value store, but it's distributed. And um, you might have two machines, you might have uh, as your initial web servers, and you might have a, a fleet of machines behind there that are ready to go. Um, and should one of the web servers disappear, they, um, it doesn't matter which machine, it might be the database servers that you have or anything else that's doing monitoring or email, for example, they can take over as a primary Cetrid daemon. Um, comes with a RESTful HTTP API and a couple of um, you know, interfaces from various languages, so Python, Ruby, um, all the other good ones as well. So, yes, okay, let's see if I can give you a little demo. Um, one second. So, great. Okay. So I've got a very simple cluster here with just two machines, and um, what you can do is you can list the various elements that you might have in, in, in Etcetrad, and then you can configure them. Uh, and you can set particular elements. So if I just go over. This is machine one. Um, sorry, I can't see this one over here. And this is machine two. And I can just do the same. So you can see they both have the same view of uh, things. So uh, let me just set a particular value. 
Um, so, so, low. so that's what I've set uh, on, on machine number one. And if I do the ls, you can see that there is a new key there and it will have a value that we can look at. So we can do that here. And sure enough, we've got the value. And just to confirm, okay, let me just try that again. Okay, a bit too much. Um, right. I was just going to show you that actually this is a different machine, but you can believe me, I guess. Uh, and if I do the same thing over here, first of all, I can do a recursive look, and, and yes, I can see that key. And again, doll gets, I'll get that key value back. Uh, as I mentioned before, there is a, um, you can access this via curl, makes it very simple. Um, bit of a, there's a couple of different versions of the API, so we're using, just going to use version two. This way you actually get a few more bits and pieces like when it was set, um, what node it was set on, um, and when it was last modified, a few other bits as well. So, um, just one. Yeah, so as I said, you can set a variable in one machine and you can see it across the entire cluster of machines. Uh, you can use the hierarchy there um, to uh, make things easier to, to um, uh, keep track of, if you like. So you look like you're about to ask a question. No? Okay. Uh, and the last component of SystemD is uh, Locksmith, and this essentially is a reboot manager. So one of the other features that Etcetera D implements is semaphores. So you can do an atomic get and set, uh, so similar to Redis. That's pretty much all it does on top of the uh, standard key value store. Uh, and this will let you, with Locksmith, you can then decide how, um, how many machines and which machines to reboot. So picking again uh, based, on, based on metadata um, or if you like how, old, how long the machine's been running or if it even has any services. Um, the idea behind that is to prevent a thundering herd problem. So uh, a while, I think about two or three weeks ago, there was a university in the US which did a Windows 7 rollout and they said go and every single machine in the entire university went, uh, including the machine that was doing the deployments. So they spent about a week uh, trying to do a recovery. Um, so that's what Locksmith is designed to prevent. So when you, don't, when you try upgrade, you don't upgrade everything all at once. Um, see that I'm running a bit low on time, um, but I'm happy to talk, take any questions or um, comments or anything like that. Go ahead. So I, I got the concept of CoreOS. Uh, mm. Now, CTRD, um, mm -hmm. can you report on examples? What, what would you use it for? Like, uh, okay. A real, real life example. Uh, okay, so a real life example that we're using it for is for our staging and production systems, we have um, different um, AWS keys. So the key is um, AWS forward slash SES, for example. Uh, we do a get on that and we get back the um, the AWS secret, and we get the um, region that we're supposed to connect to, and we get the private part that we're connect to, that we're supposed to connect to. For our staging systems, we happen to talk to US East, and our production systems happen to talk to EU West, for example. So the code that loads that configuration, it just goes to a D, says, "Give me those, give me those values, whatever they happen to be, and then I'll run with those." Uh, similarly, we do the same thing for um, access to our Postgres database. Uh, we ask for the host that we're supposed to talk to. Um, username, and password, all those bits and pieces, and that lets us. Should we have, like, should we need to? For example, we can roll our AWS keys pretty quickly, um, so we can um, update them in Etcetera D, and then uh, using uh, Locksmith, we can just ask the cluster to reboot each machine, and as it does, um, it'll pick up the new values. Gareth. Uh, so, have you looked at uh, the new Red Hat uh, Project Atomic, which is sort of similar in theory, but a bit newer? I have not looked at it. I'm I'm aware of it, uh, but no, I don't have any ideas on what it might look like. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so just following on the first question, if you use it in different environments, how do you how do you keep your configuration not in sync but um, migrated between the environments? Right. Oh, okay. So as the question there was, how do you if you're using it between different environments, how do you keep the Configuration in sync? Not, not in sync, because obviously production differs from UA, but mm -hmm. same by comparison. 
So, for example, feature toggling, how do you ensure that the, the features are all toggled the same way in the different Ah, uh, uh, good question. The answer is I don't have an answer for that. Um, we do use it for feature toggling. We have a, a key, key hierarchy called FF, feature flags, and then each feature flag, and then a value of one or, two, one or zero, depending on if it's on or off. Um, I don't have a good solution for that. How would each machine know which keys to look at to say, you know, ah. which Right. So, yeah, that's the, the bootstrap problem, essentially, for a Cetra D. So part of what you can specify to it is that there is a discovery endpoint and there's other peer endpoints. So it's one of the few places where you need to specify, here's my set of peers. Um, within a Cetra D cluster, also sort of badly termed, but that's the core of a Cetra D cluster, you can give it a list of peers and it will try them in turn. And whichever one it first contacts and meets and connects with, then it will join that peer, join that cluster and peer group. So um, you will have, as your command line invocation of a Cetra D, or as part of the user config, actually, um, or user data, as they call it, you, you'll specify here's the discovery address for or rendezvous, a rendezvous point for um, this cluster of a Cetra D daemons. And then that, um, <coughs> as long as that's unique across all your clusters, so you might have a staging cluster and a production cluster, then there's no problems with keys clashing or things like that. So you bring the new machine, you tell the machine, go here for a set of D. And the rest of it should effectively it just happen. Yes? Can you run that in an auto scanning group and then have it discover its own peers? Uh, yes. So um, the question was, can you run it in an auto scaling group and have it discover its own peers? Uh, that's kind of how we do it. Um, so you can give initial data to um, an AWS instance. So um, one of the first things it does is it goes, ah, what am I, what am I, what's the key discovery? Um, what's, it, what's my et cetera D peer location that I should st start talking to? Grabs that, starts et cetera D, and then the rest of it just happens as normal. Um, does that answer your questions? OK. All right, uh, I think I'm well and truly over time. Uh, so thank you for listening. Um, if there's further information on CoreOS, the documentation is surprisingly good, um, but that could be part of Lee because it's a paid for company um, with a lot of people behind it. Uh, if you've got questions to me, feel free to email me or tweet at me. Um, I was going to do a demo of Fleet, um, but um, yeah, I don't really think I have time, sorry. I think uh, maybe we'll leave it for okay. this time around. But, all right. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening, guys. Thank <laughs> you.